Welcome to the Talking Story Power Hour with Chai. Broadcasting, podcasting to you from a hidden bunker at an undisclosed location along the banks of the beautiful Appomattox River in the wonder city of Hopewell, Virginia. But we don't stop there. Our signal resonates into the stratosphere, the ionosphere, the mesosphere, all the spheres, and cascades down to distant locations like Blytheville, Arkansas, Minot, North Dakota, the Joint Intelligence Center Pacific located at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, Japan, South Korea, the Azores, Madrid, Spain, Fairford, England, Fayetteville, North Carolina, Tucson, Arizona, the Pentagon itself, Hampton, Virginia, and Tampa Bay, Florida, home of Special Operations and Central Command Headquarters. These were locations from which I served our country as a military service member, as well as a Department of Defense contract professional. We thank you for listening to the Talking Story Power Hour, and I am Chai Gallahan, your humble driver of these air waves, these pod waves, all these waves. As a former newspaper editor and radio broadcast journalist, show host, and producer, we report to you what the mainstream media refuses to report, or if they do report, they report in order to distort. This is what happens when 99% of the mainstream media is owned by a handful of individuals, and it's obvious who they like, who they don't like, and what kind of America they want, a country filled with uncertainty, fear, panic, and chaos. We are your voice in the night, your light in the dark, doing our part to expose the fabrications, the corruption, the psychological operations, the perception management strategies, and the outright lies being leveled at the population as part of an asymmetric attack on nothing less than America and the world itself. Okay, let's get to it. We have a very special guest on tonight's show. So if you're watching... I'm really happy that you tuned in. I'm going to get my Facebook uh, live going on here so I can see the comments as they are being uh, uh, written. You can ask questions, make observations. It's going to be a really fantastic interview. We are honored tonight to have none other than Mark Sargent as our guest. And I just want to give a brief introduction of how I found out about Mark. And it was about 2015. I was working at the Hopewell News. And somebody had mentioned something about an, a topic that sounded so outlandish, I had to look into it. I, I'd heard it on the news, maybe Coast to Coast AM, or somebody had mentioned it in the office. And you know me. I'll entertain any topic, just if nothing else, to prove it wrong or to find out more information. So that if somebody asks me about it at a barbecue or whatever, I can speak somewhat knowledgeably on it. And as I looked into this and watched the videos created by the our special guest, uh, <laughs> I was floored. So without further ado, we have none other than Mark Sargent on board. Welcome aboard to the Talking Story Power Hour, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. And two things. One, that was one of the most comprehensive introductions I've ever heard on anything ever. And not, not for me, just the show in general. Just an amazing introduction all the way around. Uh, and the other thing is, the one of the first towns you mentioned when you were broadcasting in different places, Blytheville, Arkansas. Yes. I actually did work in Blytheville, Arkansas. I installed software at the Remington Ammunition Factory there years really? ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's one of those things that, that I go... I, because I, I joke with people, I say, oh, yeah, I used to install software at places you'd never, ever go to on vacation, like Blytheville, Arkansas. And oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Small world. It is. See, I'm, I'm from Hopewell, Virginia, and I joined the Air Force to travel. And my first assignment, I get Blytheville, Arkansas. Go figure. <laughs> huh. But I, I, yeah? I, I ended up loving it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's It is a small world. <laughs> yeah. Small world indeed. Now, now, where are you now these days? I am up north of Seattle, tucked away in the northwest corner of the United States, uh, just below the San Juan Islands. So if you drive about two miles just away from here, uh, you can see Canada. You can see uh, Vancouver Island from here. So, yeah. Wow, yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of Vancouver Island because it's on the, that show Alone where they used to camp out for... 
Yeah, <laughs> it's a ama- most people think that Canada ends with uh, the west part of Canada ends with uh, Vancouver. And yeah. there is there is there's a whole other section uh, called Vancouver Island with a, a fantastic city called Victoria. Oh and, wow! Yeah, and it's it's amazing. I spent a year up there uh, a couple of years ago um, with a flat Earth woman, and it was wonderful. Fantastic. Well, hey, let's get to it. I've been teasing my 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 guests since last Friday, and I put a Facebook post up earlier saying that I had a controversial guest on, mm-hmm. and uh, so let me just ask you right off the bat. Yeah. Um, you had been looking into conspiracy theories for a long time, right? Yeah. Because you're a curious person. Yeah, yeah. I started looking into conspiracies even before the internet. Uh, saw JFK in the theater back in the early '90s and delved into it. Didn't really consider myself a tinfoil hat guy, but was very, very open-minded to just about anything. And so that, and then I, you know, I did that for a number of years until 2015 and or 2014, and that's when I started looking into flat Earth. Oh, okay. Now. Um... A little bit about your background. What is your background and your experience? My background, I started out as, believe it or not, I used to play video games professionally. And I, I won this little video game tournament back in the mid-90s and was hired by the publisher out in Boulder, Colorado. And came out there and became a ringer. This is before you, you got to you know play money in tournaments and stuff like that. And they have teams now. Uh, yeah. This was this was old school, and so I would I was a ringer that would go to the conferences and make them look the games look better than they were. Um, E3 and MacWorld San Fran and Mac, MacWorld Boston and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and then I parlayed that into proprietary software training, and so I did that pretty much for twenty years out in out in Colorado. I taught uh, blue collar software all over the country. Again, <laughs> in places you would never go to on vacation, like Blytheville, Arkansas. <laughs> and then f- I did did um did, I was always doing software stuff over there and never got married never had kids and so I had a lot of free time in my hands and got more you know as the internet got better and better I got more into the conspiracy stuff and then got really bored and it's like eh you know what what's left and and decided I would look into flat earth and it was the biggest mistake of my life to <laughs> where here we are five years later and I, I've lost count. I hundreds of interviews, I, maybe 400, 500, I don't know. Um, you know, a, th- three books, a documentary, commercials, uh, all sorts of fun things. It's been it's been amazing. And on YouTube, your Flat Earth Clues uh, videos, too, as well. Yeah. Yo, that's how that's how the whole thing started. I made a series of videos. Basically, I said that um, I looked into Flat Earth and I said, you know what? I looked at it for nine months and I just hammered away at it and said, okay, can I prove the globe in a court of law? And I realized nine months later that I couldn't. So I said, you know, I need help. So I put a series of videos together and I put them out on the internet, one a day for, I did the first seven videos in eight days and said, okay, internet hive mind, you're very, very smart. Tell me how I went wrong. Tell me how I screwed this thing up. And I thought for sure some acad- academic was going to call me up and blow the whole thing out of the water. And instead, I just started getting more and more positive reinforcements uh, from various subject matter experts and the general public and people that wanted to interview me and talk about it. And it just kept snowballing to where by the time we started up 2016, it was it was in full effect. And it's, again, amazing. It, I've gotten to do things that I never, ever thought I would have would have done. Oh, I saw the, the 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 movie that's on Netflix, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah, and, we. Yeah, it was we, amazing. Yeah, yeah, we shot that again. Talk about everything for a reason, and if you believe in fate, and I do, uh, you, you know, even the producers that made it, it was like people don't understand how hard it is to get something out there. Ninety nine percent of all films you will never see because they just don't make the cut. And mm-hmm. it, it, basically, if you don't get a distributor right away, you have to go to film festivals. And most people can't even get into film festivals. Like the, the first one we did was the Toronto Film Festival up in um, did that, that beginning of 2018. And, the, you know, there were 3000 submissions to the Toronto Film Festival. And they had to choose 100 and not. And out of those 100, maybe you get the top 10 that you know get mentions and awards and stuff like that and out of those maybe two are picked up by amazon or itunes or netflix or something like that and i think we got into every film festival that we entered 
And but but again, the producers, why would why would they think it get in? It's like pff, okay, first off, nobody ever gets in anyway, and it's flat Earth. There's no way we're getting this That's in. Right. That's all right. So now now here's a all right. People have heard it's about flat Earth, and you started looking into it, mm -hmm. and you couldn't prove the globe in a court of law. Nope. Now they're 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 probably rolling their eyes now, face palming themselves, right. saying what uh, what's Chai? What's this guy, Mark Sargent? What are they talking about? So right. what exactly is a flat Earth? Can you fall off the edge of it? No, no. And what we're talking about here is I'll, I'll, I'll break it down as simply as I can. You're not living on this tiny little rock covered in water and smoke flying through an impossibly huge universe at unbelievable speeds. Um, you are living in a building. There is no space. There is no universe. You're just sitting up probably somewhere on a desk. It's like a sci-fi movie. You're, you're living in a, in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling. And it is so large it, from our perspective that even our best and brightest didn't figure it out till almost 1960. We, mm -hmm. we just didn't have the technology to actually figure it out. And, and because we, we needed the internal combustion engine just to get, you know, planes up and running. And that was, wasn't until 1900. Mm -hmm. And then um, once they figured it out in 1960, they decided, well, you know what? Civilization's pretty much built. We probably shouldn't tell anybody. Because the shock waves would would upend everything, they would it would just be chaos, and so that's what they did. They just kept on. They it's, we had nothing to do with the building of this place. Uh, it's like the line from Contact. We don't know who built it. You know, we didn't build it. We don't know who did. Uh -huh. And um, they just kept it a secret. That's that's all they did. It was just time and money, and they they locked down the outer edge, which is Antarctica, and then they militarized space and that was all they needed to do and the rest of it was just keep everybody busy and here we are we we never figured it out and but the the big thing of course was to fake space you know convince people that everything you know they just started talking about stuff oh yeah this is this is you know ten thousand light years away and this is a hundred thousand light years away and this is what this is and it's like no you're looking at lights on a ceiling no different than a planetarium and I know that dates me a little bit, and a lot of people haven't been to planetariums, but that's yeah. the people. I get that argument all the time. It's like it's like, what are you saying the planets are? I go look. If you go to a planetarium, does the moon look spherical? Yes, it does. Uh, can you land on it? No, you can't. Why not? Well, it's because it's just an image up there. It's just lights and lights on a ceiling. And I say, um, when you walk outside of that planetarium, who say you're just not in a much much bigger one that was built by somebody else? And, you know, there have been sci-fi books and movies and television shows that have talked about uh, this sort of concept for years and years and years. I'm really surprised more of the, more the sci-fi crowd didn't get into this. Maybe it's too big. It's so big. Yeah. It's like, nah, can't be. Can't be. It's like, well, could be. It, it does. That, that's exactly my reaction. When I first heard about this uh, in Flat Earth Theory, I said, no way. This thing is so ridiculous. I, I'm going to look into this so that way if anybody brings it up, I can shoot them down. Right. And then I watched your videos and a few other people had some series out there and a few other books with proofs of you know things that are impossible um, if the earth is exactly what we've been told it is right so right. now all right people are looking here and they're saying well before we go into that yeah. so you're saying we had rocket technology we didn't have the capability of realizing that the earth was flat until we could get up so high with rockets is that what it was well well that, it was two parts um one yeah the the one of the big things was rocket technology which was but by then i think they had already figured it out what I'm seeing is back in 1960, remember NASA was founded in 1958, and I don't think it was an accident that the Antarctic Treaty was formed in 1959, and there was high altitude uh, atomic tests done from basically 58 until 62. Yeah. Where, where all the, all the high-end nukes were, they were just being, they were going straight up for four years. And what... What it looks like happened was they were doing missions in Antarctica. What I think happened was the early mission, you look up a guy named Richard Byrd, Admiral Byrd, the youngest admiral in the history of the United States Navy. And he does a mission in 1926. He's the first person to fly to the North Pole. And he finds something that confirms the ancient maps, the old maps. Because remember, if you had old maps in 1920, what are you going to do? And you, know, you, you don't have much in the way of technology. And instead of spending, the, there's a, you know, he's, he's more known for the whole hollow earth theory. Supposedly he went up there and saw this, you know, journey to the center of the earth thing and, and a whole another civilization up there. And you think, wow, he would have kept going, you know, he would have spent more time there. No, from 1928 up until his death in 1957, he spent the remaining decades of his career flying around Antarctica. 
that's all the guy did. He's probably the, one of the, if not the greatest uh, explorer the United States ever had. Sure. And he goes on television in 1954, uh, a show called The Long Jeans Chronoscope, which is basically the 60 minutes of its day. And he says that he's, he's getting ready for another mission. And he goes, Antarctica is the most amazing place ever. He goes, there's, it's basically just made out of money. He goes, his entire mountain range made out of coal. Uh, there's uranium, there's oil, there's gas, there's minerals, there's everything. He goes, we're going to be fighting over this thing for the next hundred years. You know, yeah. they, they, no, it's going to be, you know, he's, he was afraid there actually might be military conflict down there. Goes down for his very next mission in 1955, 1956, which was Operation Deep Freeze. And whatever he found during that mission, the, everything just changed at that point meaning uh everybody that was on the ice got off the ice it, it was like nope uh -huh. would they and they locked that place down meaning yeah. all all the countries that were down there argentina and chile and and australia and new zealand and the united states and russia they all left and they they put in place the antarctic treaty which is the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties that still to this day and in fact it's not even up for review until 2040 2041 uh -huh. and it basically says that no corporation from any country for any reason can do anything down there forever and yes. it's like and and you gotta understand from the united states standpoint that is absolute crap <laughs> it's like we can frack in your backyard tomorrow if That's we right. want if we want to and you're telling me that the greatest oil companies in the world can't not only can they not go down there they, they can't even talk about it that's the part that blew me away. It's like nobody's running full page ads in the New York Times and the London Times and the Washington Post saying how many jobs would be great, how great it would be to go to Antarctica. And that was the once they locked that down, then they just militarized space, which was they sent up rockets and the only people that go up there are the military. And yeah. that's it. And then every all the other nations blueprinted off them. And most of the employees, I know I'm jumping around a little bit. Most of the sure. employees that work at these space agencies don't know anything. They don't know crap. They they polish fuel systems. They they mop the floors. They do HR. The only people that need to know anything are the telemetry guys, which is one of the reasons I love the uh, the independent film from 1978, uh, Capricorn One, so yes. much, where they faked a Mars mission. In fact, right. the, the, they had to kill the astronauts in real life because the public was told that they were on the, the rocket that blew up. With yeah, them supposed to be in it. it. Exactly. Exactly. And now, in truth, of course, you know, part of it was for plot design. They would have put those guys in a witness re relocation. But the guys already agreed in the movie. Oh, no, we're going to go to the press. That's like, OK, we're going to kill you. Now, yeah. in truth, because there were military guys, they were they were Air Force. They couldn't have done it anyway. That goes under uh, the, the the banner of treason. There there would have been no court case. There was, they had they they could have killed them and absolutely gotten away with it. And but anyway, um, but the, what I think was more interesting was the reason the, the entire film was made in the first place. The film was made because the Apollo mission, the Americans, you know, the moon missions from from the '60s, were of such poor quality that the there was a producer um i can't remember if it was a cbs producer or a cbs affiliate in a studio that said that was angry he was he's going this is some of the most grainy horrible stuff he goes he goes i could make a better mood mission than this right he it's not that yeah. he thought it was fake he just thought that the production was terrible and he oh, goes yeah. and he goes he goes not only that he goes i could make a better mars mission than these guys and he got funding together and made capricorn one you could never get away with that movie today you would no, no. never in a million years. I mean, and of course, love the fact that it was like one of the only roles that uh, O.J. Simpson actually played it straight. Wasn't common. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, listen, Mark, uh, we've got I've got this Facebook Live. There have been some comments I want to read from the beginning. We've got quite a few people uh, watching this, and I'm going to share it on other uh, pages too. Okay. The first comment was uh, Dave Hoopsick. He says, "I think the Earth is a triangle with an eye in the middle," uh, making an Illuminati reference, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Uh, Troy, Troy Fletcher, I think he's in Tennessee. He's like, hey, cat, seriously? Hey, bro. <laughs> hey, Troy. And then Joel Roberts says, wait, I missed that. Was it called Capricorn? Capricorn 1. Capricorn Joel. 1. Can't, can't yeah. miss it. With, um, okay, so, you know, and, and it's with the, the, the oh, uh, who's the guy that played Thanos? Was that um, James? Brian Dennehy? No, no, it was Brolin, one of the Brolin. Well, anyway, the Brolin's son, yeah, Brolin. the the yeah. one of the the lead astronaut was the father of the guy that played Thanos. Okay. Um. Okay. So anyway, yeah, it was, it was Capricorn One. Great cast. It was amazing. Uh, it was the number one independent film of that year, 
and uh, it was a it was a great science fiction film to this day. I think it stands very well, and in the conspiracy crowd, it's it's wonderful. I'm a soundtrack aficionado, and the the, the main theme to Capricorn One is fantastic. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, I, I it was a, it was a cool little film, and I and I remember watching it back in the day, and it for me as I got into conspiracies, it became more and more relevant, because again, you absolutely can fake it. You know, it's mm -hmm. it don't don't tell me you cannot fake space. Don't tell me you can't fake space missions. I mean, for God's sakes, we we look at look at just uh, the the movie Gravity is gorgeous, right? Yes. And you could intersplice anything without showing you know, like Sandra Bullock's face or anything like that into mm -hmm. a NASA and a NASA thing in, in a heartbeat. Interstellar or one of my favorites. I mean, you want to see how how well we did it even back in the day. Look at two thousand one: A Space Odyssey by Stanley sure. Kubrick, sure, which who has been you know the whispers not even whispers <laughs> that that he was the guy that did research for nasa on how to fake space and they let him you know because he took five years to make that movie and he got huge government grants for it which nobody wants to talk about and they i think he asked me it's like hey when i'm done researching all this can i turn the footage into a movie it's like yeah as long as you don't you know give away too much and it, sure. it was best picture of the year Oh yeah, yeah. Won, won a ton of Academy Awards. Why wouldn't it? Oh, you you watch it on Blu Ray now? It's gorgeous. It is. In fact, he left some clues in another movie. Stanley Kubrick. He did The Shining. Yes. There yeah. He he destroyed Stephen, Stephen King's book. Yes. In the process, and um, in fact, you can look up the the. You probably saw the documentary, um, Room Two Three Seven. Yes. Where uh, he he basically was giving away clues. The whole movie was his odyssey of making the moon mission and yes. how it was a dream that turned into a nightmare and and of course that would have been the case i mean if you're a director a young director and the government writes you basically a blank check to and it's like yeah take as much time as you want uh it's a dream it's a dream come true and then he realizes it's kind of like the movie wag the dog where at the real it's like oh yeah by the way you can't tell anybody anything about this right about what you're what exactly you're doing for us and I think um, I think he had I think that one of his one of his friends was killed, which is why he referenced the um, the black caretaker that got hit mm -hmm. with the axe. I think that was straight out of you know it was straight out of his experience where he was just he took it too far. Of course, you know why why how could he keep it a secret entirely? I think it was very very tough to do. Yeah, very very huge. And that's another topic too. Now, what I found interesting about when I heard uh, about flat Earth theory and I started looking into it. Um, I, I looked into a lot of other conspiracy theories or, or whatever topics before this, mm -hmm. like the fake space footage, because I've seen fake space. This is long before I heard about Flat Earth. Right. And, of course, I discovered, yes, there is fake space footage, a lot of it. And Hollow Earth, that's how I heard about Admiral Byrd. He's from Virginia, by the way. Oh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I did not realize that. Or at least he lived here. Richmond International Airport, as it's known now, up until like a decade or 15 years ago, was called Byrd Airport. Ah. Uh -huh. um, so, but yeah, so all these different conspiracies that I looked into in the past, they sort of came into, they, they fell into place when it came to flat earth. They were like pieces of it. Yeah. So now, now what are some of the things that people can say, all right, you're, you're talking about space footage and Antarctica and all this, but how can you actually prove that the earth is flat? I'll give you my well-known five bullet points that, um, I was, I was kind of ambushed by a German television team a few years ago where they said, look, come, come up with five scientific points because we got a guy from a physicist from Georgetown. We want to run it by him. It's like, OK, sure. So real, real fast. Um, first and foremost, and I didn't come up with any of these. I mean, the, the Flat Earth community did this on their own. Uh, first one is long distance photography. You can see okay. things way, way, way further than you should be able to. And you basically, you, people can't see the forest for the trees because they, they, we're, we are not taught a lot, especially in America. We are not, we're, we are basically pushed through high school. <laughs> it's, like, yes. it's like, unless you're specialized in something, you do not learn much about chemistry or engineering or physics or microbiology or even economics. You are just it's like, yeah, we'll get you in. Can you drive? Great. You're gone. <laughs> and th that's basically it. And so long distance photography, what I mean is, is that um, the curvature of the earth, according to mainstream science, we didn't come up with this, is eight inches per mile per mile, which is eight inches per mile squared. And, and again, most people forget algebra from even junior high. 
including me, is like, oh, wow, what is eight inches per mile squared? That means that every, it's not every mile is eight inches. It means it gets, it, it amplifies over time. So at three miles, it's three times three, which is nine times eight is 72. At 10 miles, it's 10 times 10, which is 100 times eight, which is 800 inches. To where you get like at 50 miles, you're, you're pushing 1,700 feet of curvature, which sure. means you can't see. Something should be eventually hidden by the hill. It should be on the over, uh, the other side of the hill. And we see boats go off into the distance. They, they, they disappear and people, the myth has always been, oh, they go on the other side of the curvature. What changed was HD technology. Now with HD technology, you can zoom in on things, you know, 10, even 15 years ago, you could zoom in with a $3,000 camera and it would still be fuzzy and horrible. But sure. now I, for 500 bucks, you can zoom in and that boat that used to be gone is now back on back in frame. And you can do this over and over again until it becomes just this tiny little pixel that just fades away. Eventually the, the, the atmosphere becomes thick enough. Remember, we're not what we're talking to, through here is only about 99.9% .9 transparent. We're, we're basically in a thin version of water. It's mostly nitrogen and partially a little bit of oxygen and some trace gases. Yes. So that's, that's the first one, which is you can see way, way, way too far. Don't give me, you know, some people's like, why can't I see Japan from California? And why can't I see Europe from New York? And why can't I see Mount Everest from everywhere? And yeah. that's, and that's because the atmosphere is too thick. It's for the same reason why when you're underwater, why you can't see a whale at 400 yards. Or sure. when you're diving down to um, 200 feet in the middle of the summer, the sun is gone. And that's because the, the light can only go so far. Um, second one would be gravity versus the atmosphere or, or gravity versus the um, vacuum of space, which is what wins. Uh, you know, pe people all, all the time, gravity is the solution for all this. Oh, it's got to be gravity. It's got to be gravity. It's so, like, okay, when you suck a soda out of a glass with a straw, right, the, the, the vacuum force that you're creating with your mouth is, um, is, is going to defeat uh, gravity all day long. You can, you can sure. always get it. If you create a vacuum chamber above you, in the room above you, and you create a valve, and you have a little, you know, um, and you pop that thing, it's not like the movies. It, it, is, it is very, very fast. Uh, you can look this up online, anything in a vacuum chamber, look up uh, vacuum versus steel rail car. That's one of my favorites, where it okay. is instant, it is violent. Some movies get it right, but most of them don't. I mean, it is- It takes a long time and people are holding on and you know. Oh yeah, yeah, it's like, oh yeah, like the end, I, I now have a completely new <laughs> appreciation for the end of Aliens, <laughs> where, where yes, Ripley's- <laughs> Ripley's climbing out of the ladder. It's like, no, she's dead. The girl's dead. Hicks is dead. Uh, the alien, of course, is dead. They're all dead. That Roll credits. That's it. And it's over in uh, about half of a second. Yeah. Um, so the, the point is, if you pop that valve, the air would equalize instantly. The, the air would just leave where you are and go upstairs. And... The, and it's like, well, okay, well, you know full well. It's like, why didn't the, the gravity in your room keep the air in your room? Well, it's because the vacuum is stronger. It's always strong. Vacuum will always win. So that point is... The, pro Earth, the problem is when you go outside, yeah. why is our atmosphere still here? Because according to mainstream science, uh, space is just this huge, huge, huge vacuum, which, which is an amazing force. And science has no answer for this. And in fact, I, I put a challenge to any scientist. I go, tell me where the bleeding ed edge of space is. Where does our atmosphere end and space begin? And, and what happens there? <laughs> what what exactly yeah. you know what happens at that edge because no no one can explain it to me um but at, at the same time doesn't it make more sense if it's in a pressurized system if you're in a, like a snow globe or a terrarium or planetarium it's a pressurized system the air is not going anywhere doesn't the term greenhouse gases make more sense if it's an actual greenhouse don't tell me the fluorocarbons just get up to a certain altitude and it's then not. don't go off into space it's yeah whatever uh, number three would be the eclipse shadow that's an uh -huh. easy one uh the the moon is 2,000 miles wide if you listen to mainstream science but the eclipse shadow is only 70 miles wide okay um we only say the moon is le you know less than 70 miles wide and you know shadows can only be same size or bigger they can never get smaller you know, you, you can never recreate that down here, not without a whole bunch of funky lenses. When you walk by a building, your shadow doesn't shrink down to the size of an action figure. 
Never ever yeah. happens. And you yeah. say, well, it well, there, it can. It's like, okay, even if you convince me that it can, then why doesn't that happen when the sun, uh, when the earth f goes in front of the sun and it casts mm -hmm. on the moon? There should be a 250 mile wide blackout zone. Remember, the earth is supposedly 8,000 miles wide. The earth, the moon should turn into a giant eyeball. We never ever see it. It's either a blood moon or the thing just get, completely gets obscured. Four is the moon, temp moon temperature, mm -hmm. which is uh, the moon gives off a cold light. And people say, well, is it cold at night? No, I mean, the moon is generating a cold laser light that mm -hmm. we have been able to replicate in universities for a number of years now. In fact, we include it in some health products, meaning if it is cooler in the shade when you are in the sunlight, it is the opposite in the moonlight, which can't be because remember the moon is only glowing because it's radi you know it's reflecting some of the sun's radiation. It should be neutral. It should never ever go negative, and we've seen negative thirteen degrees Fahrenheit, meaning it's warmer in the moonshade than the moonlight. The moon is an LED cool laser, and it's self illuminating. And now, does that lean towards a flat Earth? Mm, maybe, but it destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. Last but not yeah, I, least, my favorite oh, is... Uh, I actually went out. I heard you talking about this and some other people talking about this. And last year, I went out with one of those handheld temperature guns. Mm. And I was checking moonlit areas, you know, in the middle of the night. Yeah. And the shade, and the moon shade, for the most part, in my backyard, yeah. was was it was warmer in the shade than it was in the moonlight. Yeah. So I thought, wow, that's the, you're not kidding. No, no, I'm not, I'm not kidding. And we, and it gets even weirder. I mean, we've done tests with magnify or with um with water and copper strips, and they're, they're the videos are in my channel under experiments. And what what I I will take total credit for this, where because I said because well, I had a guy call me up on the show and ask me and ask me and, and tell me, hey, have you heard about the moonlight thing? I was going no, and and we even I I would I had been in flat Earth for a year. And I'm going get out of here, and. It is so weird. And I go, what happens when you, know, when you magnify sunlight? You know, you can burn paper. Sure. When, when you magnify moonlight, what happens? It gets, oh, it gets even colder. Does it? It gets even colder by a couple degrees. It's like, holy smokes, which is what would happen if you were using a cold laser. Um, my last one, the fifth and final one, which is my favorite, is the Van Allen radiation trap question. Yes. Because there's no way, there's no way to beat it. Which is, uh, are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly? Yes or no? It's a simple question. And no matter which way you go, you're screwed. Because if you say, <laughs> yes, they are deadly, then I say, oh, great. So how did the Americans get through the Van Allen belts multiple times on what, six times round trip? And yeah. nobody died, nobody got radiation poisoning, and nobody got cancer. There's still five of these guys limping around today. Yeah. And, and you say, well, what do you mean? I go, well, there's only two things that can stop radiation as far as spacecraft go. Uh, or any vehicle, which is uh, gold and lead, and gold is twice as dense as lead, and or a whole bunch of water, which they use in, in power reactors, and and the Americans didn't use any of that. They they used aluminum and and plastic. Well, that's how how does that happen? Then you yeah. then you'll backtrack. Then you say, well, no, it's not deadly, and you say, um, well, okay. If it's not deadly, then you can go to the NASA.gov website, and there's a wonderful video there. It won a local Emmy called a Ryan Trial by Fire. It won yeah. at the end of 2014. They are very specific, very clear that they're not going to test any manned capsules for the Mars missions uh, because they haven't solved the, 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 the radiation problem. And it's like, what? What are you talking about? You solved it perfectly, flawlessly. Nothing ever went wrong with the radiation. I have no idea if the left hand didn't know what the right was doing. But anyway, so those five questions gave to the physicist at Georgetown and he folded. That was it. He was like, nope, we're not doing this. Now, in all fairness, I think he folded because there were a couple questions. Scientists are really big on sticking to their scope. You know, yeah. if it's if it's outside of their wheelhouse, they don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the moonlight question alone would have thrown him to where he would like, I don't know. I mean, I've thrown it at other physicists, too, and they don't know. They don't even they've never even heard of such a thing. They don't even know. Yeah. They don't even know how, how to address it. Uh, only, you know, the only just straight up denial. I said, no, that can't be true. It's like, well, watch the videos. I mean, hell, I've done it myself. My friends have done it. We, we've all done this. It's a real thing. I've done it, and that's what I love about it. It's something you can do with a cheap piece of equipment, just a thermometer gun, yeah, infrared, you know, laser thermometer gun, whatever. And you can go out in your backyard, and you can do it the next full moon. And and that's the thing. I guess that's why it's something provable, but no one really considered 
conducting such an experiment. No, and, and nor did anyone w relate it to, you know, where we could be living. There was a guy, that was a wonderful video on my channel, guy went out with sort of like a predator vision. <laughs> you know, he oh, had yeah. predator vision on his camera where it was thermal and thermal video. And he went back and forth and he was not a flat earth guy. And by the time he was done, you know, not that long later, he's like, well, I can only tell you what I've shot, and it's you know there it is, hot, cold, hot, cold. So yeah, it was it was great. Now now here's another one that people can do is especially if you live near the Great Lakes of this example that I know of. It's a famous example where across the Great Lake from Chicago, which is like 60 miles, maybe 70 miles from a certain point, you can see the Chicago skyline, which right. should be submerged or not submerged uh, beneath about maybe 1100 feet of curve from that distance yeah. but yet there it is and the meteorologist who who got the the footage he tried to explain it away as a mirage oh yeah 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 and, you know they they try to explain it as a mirage and yet he's talked to meteorologists and, and other scientists that said that um that it actually came up with the whole term of atmospheric lensing and that is like, okay, well, that kind of helps us because, again, atmospheric lensing, you guys, you don't know when you're because remember, we're talking, we're living and breathing in basically a thin version of water and water distorts light. Well, if, okay, so if that's the case, then atmospheric lensing, you're just all you're doing is cutting off the top and the bottom. When you take a magnifying glass to anything, you're zooming in on the on on the inner section, but the outer sections get very, very distorted. Um, a mirage is something completely different. A mirage is, uh, uh, you know, when we blew that away with the time lapse footage, which again wasn't taken by us. It was a wonderful thing. I think it's about fifty something miles to, to to across Lake Michigan. But he, I mean, I watched a twelve hour time lapse footage. Nothing wavered. Nothing became inverted. Nothing, nothing flickered. You watched it go through weather and then turn to night. In fact, you could even it was the detail was enough to where you could see the cleaning teams going up this building. You know, because they 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 turn on the lights on one floor and they go up and up and up. Yeah, it was, oh, wow. it was brilliant. Yeah. Now, hey, um, another one. Um, I think scientists actually measured this without realizing the implications. They they said that the state of Kansas was as flat as a pancake. Yes, yes. There are numerous places, although Kansas has got to be one of the bigger ones. Um, the, because people, again, that wasn't done because of us. That was done because there were some students, you know, they, they were tired of the jokes. If you've ever been to Kansas or Nebraska, but really Kansas, um, you yeah. drive truckers drive through there and it's just flat, 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 flat. And they measured one end and the other. And it's one of those places that doesn't have any hills or valleys. And it was tabletop flat. And yeah. that and so the question is, how can that be tabletop flat if the earth mm -hmm. has eight inches per mile per mile, you know, um, curvature to it? And science, yeah. the only thing science, they only have one response. The scientists come back and say, oh, well, it's just a really, really flat part of the curve and yeah. like okay so hundreds of miles and and no no curve and there's apparently all sorts of places like this all over the all over the globe where there's these tabletop flat areas and the scientists have no choice they can only come back with oh no well it's just a flat area but it's still a globe but it's just a really really <laughs> flat area it's like oh well, wait wait i've got you mark i've got you with this one hmm. it can't be flat because we have millions of photos of a globe earth what you, what you <laughs> yeah I, I saw the photo uh, of the earth and it's round it's it's a sphere so okay it, okay first off we, it, it was assumed that we had photos a whole bunch of photos of the earth the what? very first you got you can look this up i put this in the description box of every video i make and um yeah. it was the uh, the second blue marble shot that was ever mm -hmm. released the first blue marble shot was taken in 1972 at the end of apollo 17 really blew me away that Apollo 8 through 16 never took a full disc shot of the Earth. It was only on, Apollo 17 was the last mission. On the way home, it was like, oh, hey, we might want to get a shot of the Earth before we, you know, just pack it up. And <laughs> it's the only, and, and you would have thought, why not take a picture of North America at some point? It's an American space program. No, it took a picture of exactly one thing, which was the entire continent of Antarctica. It was the bottom part of Africa and the Antarctica. It's like, really? There's two birds with one stone. Here's where it gets weird. And you can look this up. This is not, this is not imaginary. The okay. second blue marble shot that was ever taken. So remember, the first one was in 1972. The second shot that was ever taken was the summer of 2015. 
we went 43 years without taking a shot of Earth from space, a full disk shot of Earth. And you're saying, well, no, there's tons of shots. It's like not well, one, not full disk, and the rest are computer generated, and they'll admit to half of them. You know, we 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 take for granted. We fill in the gaps with science fiction movies. You know, we we watch so much science fiction that have de has dealt with space stuff that that just fills in all the blanks that we have. Forty three years, we never took a second blue marble shot of the Earth. We only know they took a second blue marble shot because Obama was the one that tweeted it. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was Scott Kelly was the one that did the press briefing supposedly from the space station. When mm. and, and and the space station did, w didn't even take it. It was supposedly taken from a, another satellite, another Japanese satellite. It was just stunning to me that we went almost all the seventies, all the eighties, all the nineties, two thousand to two thousand and ten. I'm oh, sorry, ninety to two thousand and and two thousand two thousand ten and halfway to two thousand twenty. No one took a shot of the Earth with all that stuff that's up there. No, nah. nope, nope. Statistically impossible. Statistically, Nothing. absolutely impossible. That, and of course, you know, find me uh, a footage of any astronaut that turned the camera on and, and spun around 360 degrees. That's never happened. Never happened. And also, also things that have never happened. There has never been a video of a rocket from the rocket's point of view with the camera pointing down with the rocket leaving orbit and the Earth forming into a globe. That's never happened in the history of space travel. None of these things have happened. And the public just took everything for granted. It was brilliant. I mean, even the, the stuff in the 80s, we weren't paying attention so much that in the 80s, they were releasing movies where the guys that were going up there weren't even using pressurized spacesuits. They were wearing short sleeves, sh shirts, no gloves, uh, the, the, the motorcycle helmet helmets. I mean, they were, they were motorcycle helmets. I thought they were just for display. They were connected to nothing. You could see their bare necks. <laughs> it's like, what? And is this extravehicular activity? EDP? Well, no, 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 no. But, but the thing was every, everything interior shots with the exception of the ISS, when you're in a rocket going up somewhere, you're wearing a full blown spacesuit. That's, sure, that's sure. what you're doing, and none of these guys were, but no one was paying attention. The 80s, we could have cared less. I'm telling you, I was there. I totally get it. And plus the resolution, but plus there was no internet, so no one could double check anything. And yeah. you know, no one, had, no one, no one was recording any of that on VCR. All it turns out, there were a few people that record that stuff, and then they put it up on YouTube. Wow, interesting. No. Okay, now, now, all right. So I, I looked into this. I'm a, I was a visual information specialist uh, when I was in the military, yeah. and also, um, you know, did a lot of that worked in intel mm -hmm. and so i looked into the whole cgi globe thing and it apparently is true because there's a nasa scientist saying we have to do that they have layers for the reflection of the sun on the water they have layers for the clouds they have strips of satellite yeah the, the, like together. he was his name is robert simmons and uh -huh. he wasn't a nasa scientist he was a nasa artist he artist. was he was the guy that made the very first background for the iphone so when the iPhone was released, they was like, oh, we got to make a globe background. And he ran into the same problem I did, which was back in 2004, I think, when he, when he was initially working on this. He was do, trying to do research, and he was trying to look up pictures of the Earth from space. Well, there was only one. That was the Blue Marble 1 from 1972. Yeah. And he was asking, like, you know, and, and he'll tell you in the audio interview. It's like, yeah, we didn't have anything. So he had to create it from scratch using Photoshop. And people assumed, because why wouldn't you, that that was an actual NASA shot from space. Here's where it gets interesting. One, it was found out after we were looking at it that it was just, not only was he photoshopping it, but he must have not been getting, he must have finished it on a Friday or something uh -huh. because he used the cloning tool, if you guys know Photoshop at all. Yes. In the Southern Hemisphere and just clone the hell out of it. But people yep. don't look in the Southern Hemisphere, so they didn't pay attention. And so all the clouds in the Southern Hemisphere, there's these tri doubles and triples of all these yeah, clouds, of all these clouds. <laughs> and I was like, what? And and so it's like, wait, was he late? Was he going to miss the hot wings or something if he, if he didn't get this thing done in time? And the, but what blew me away was when we were shooting the documentary, mm -hmm. when we went down to the Space Center down in Houston. That image was on one of NASA's wall. In fact, it was inside a space shuttle and it didn't have anything next to it. You know, it didn't have a caption or anything. It was there on the wall. And it's like that image, that very, very, you know, image, of course, because technically they owned it because he was their employee. And yes. I'm pointing out, you know, I was there with Patricia Steer, the documentary team. I'm going, look, this is the blue, you know, the, the, the iPhone shot. It was completely fabricated from layers using Photoshop. 
Did that make it into the documentary? No, it did not because they didn't want to hear it because the documentary people hated Flat Earth. They hated that topic. Yeah, I think it got you a lot of attention. I, so I enjoyed it for that aspect of it. Oh, yeah. No, hey, it, you know the old saying, um, uh, all publicity is good publicity or um, even bad publicity is free. And yeah. it, we got huge amount of attention, mostly mostly when Netflix picked it up at the end of um, 2018. They, yeah. they picked it up going into 2019, and, I mean, everything just exploded. Because I, I had no idea that if you're under 30 years old, that basically your major form of entertainment, your best bang for the buck is Netflix. Uh -huh. And so all these people were watching it, and it was trending. On top of it, you know, Netflix put it up, you know, on the far, far left of the documentary yeah. thing. And a lot of people watch that. And we get tons and tons of attention. It's like, great, wonderful. I mean, people, do, I mean, it's like, yeah, it was, it wasn't a flat earth propaganda piece. But look, I sat in the studio audiences with a lot of, you know, different places, different countries on top of it. And watch what the people's reaction was. And by the time we got, you know, 100 minutes later, they had so many questions. They had so many questions because they they were blown away. In the first 30 minutes, they didn't think it was real, meaning they didn't even think the movie was real. They thought it was a spoof or a docu a docufiction. And then all of a sudden it clicked. It's like, wait a minute. There's something really big and scary on the Internet, and I have no idea. I've never seen anything like this before. And they were just blown away. I mean, I when they found out that I, that I was in the audience up in the, the Toronto Film Festival, we, had, we were eventually kicked out of the theater. We, they, people wouldn't leave. We were just mobbed with people with questions. And it yeah. was, it was yeah. awesome. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, hey, I've got a short, uh, like a minute and few seconds of a sponsor message I need to share. Yeah. And a nice time for a quick break if you need one. Okay. Um, would, would it be okay if I did that right now? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Thanks, Mark. And once again, you're listening to the Talking Story Power Hour with me, your humble host, Chai. And we have our guest, our special guest, Mark Sargent of the Flat Earth Theory. And you can watch the Flat Earth the Theory video on Netflix. What's that called, Mark? Is it Flatten the Curve? Uh, it's called Behind the Curve. Behind the Curve. Yep. Okay. All right. So we'll be right back after we share this from our sponsor. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Talking Story Power Hour with Chai. All right, looking for an employment opportunity? Listen to the end. Employers might want to create a safer place for their staff. Biological contaminants or hazards can exist in the workplace air supply. The air circulating through buildings could be carrying those contaminants. One business that can help with this situation is Ducks. That's D-U-C-T-Z. You should call Ducks today because they can come out and assess the system and they can clean it out, leaving your home or business healthy, the air in it healthy. Also, having Ducks clean your system annually can help cut utility costs. So call Duck for a free estimate, Ducks for a free estimate at the following number. And as you know, I'll include the number in the podcast on Anchor.fm and Spotify, because if I include it here now, the automatic algorithms will cut me off because they've recognized the phone number. Or you can simply visit Ducks, that's D-U-C-T-Z dot com, to learn about Ducks. Now, looking for an employment opportunity? Business is booming for Ducks. They are hiring technicians and assistants. You can do whatever you want and get paid a very competitive wage with on-the-job training. You're getting paid as you're learning. So anyway, call them for more details at the number that I gave. So now let's get back to the interview. Thanks for listening to the Talking Story Power Hour. We have a very special guest on tonight. All of our guests are special, but this is someone who I've known about for a long time because when I hear outlandish sounding conspiracy theories, you know me, I've got to look into them because I like to, to know about things, you know. And so we have Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Theory on with us. And so um, let me get the Facebook back on so you can leave comments and I can see what you're writing. So if you have any questions, by all means, leave us a comment and I'll re respond to it. If you have any statements, um, definitely leave those too. All right, and once again, I've got Mark Sargent on. We just took a quick break for our sponsors. And let's see, make sure I can see the comments. Okay, comments are up. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We've got a pretty big audience here, and I'm going to share these to the Tri-City Highlights page, the News Patriot page, Facebook pages, and the Wonder City Herald Facebook page. Of course, the Talking Story Power Hour Facebook page. I highly encourage you to come and watch this from the beginning if you're just tuning in late. 
So, Mark, are you still there? Yep. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, um, yeah, I have to say that it was jaw-dropping, the, the facts and, and the, the theories and everything you put out about flat earth theory. Um, so what else can you say to someone who says, but look, we still, you know, they, they think that the, the, the blue marble shots, you say there are two blue marble shots that have been taken. Right. The rest are CGI, yep. overlay, you know, digitally created images of the earth. What about the blue marble shots? How do we explain that? Oh, well, the first one, 1972, I mean, that was way before Photoshop. That was just airbrushed and touched up with paint. You know, it was it was photo editing in, in its infancy. And that's one of those things where, you know, I included a, a, a shot from Apollo um, uh, 12, I believe, where, you know, they, they're really nervous about doing uh, a lot of fake stuff. Because they they know that you know the, the the internet hive mind, especially the the nerd community, they don't miss much. Yeah. And so I mean, li I mean, literally, that's why we have moviemistakes.com. If a coffee cup moves from one side of the room to the other without the character moving it, you're going to hear about it. Yeah. And so doing too many Earth shots, they were just nervous. They didn't know what to do. Now they they put out some unofficial shots. That are out there, but very, very few movies like Galileo, the 1990 movie where the Earth's spinning, but the weather never morphed in 24 hours. Yeah. You know, they're very gun shy about that. Um, it was interesting, like um, Al Gore during the um, during what was it? Uh, uh, Inconvenient Truth, the, the sequel, the second one. He was talking yeah. about how he was the vice president and he had the first blue marble shot on his office. And during his vice presidency, he called NASA up himself and said, hey, can I get an updated version of this? And they said, <laughs> and they said, no, sorry, we don't have it. And he actually started a satellite program to try to see if he could get another shot. And of course, they stalled and stalled until he was out of office and then they dropped it entirely. Um, when it comes to the second blue marble shot, you can look it up if you want. I mean, it's that, that by that time, 2015, no, we have tons of great Photoshoppers. That are out there. Photoshop is a very, very, very powerful thing. We can fake a lot of stuff, but you don't want to push it too far because nerds can will figure out stuff eventually. Movie, like the the little shot I, I sent you there of um, Apollo twelve in Skype, mm -hmm. for example, uh, the perfect example. You know, I I won't even really count. I know people say, you know, why on on none of the moon missions were there any stars visible. And yeah, people say, well, it's an exposure setting, you know, but it's obviously a camera setting, you know, it's too bright, blah, blah, you know, whatever contrast. I don't care. That's not the point. The point, the reason why they did it is because it was too hard to, to keep the algorithm straight, meaning all, you know, if the belt over Orion, because everything was time date stamped, if the belt over Orion is in the wrong place. There's nothing you can do to get out of that. Some nerd in Nebraska in his underwear at 3 a.m. is going to figure that out and he's going to post it and it's going to get out there. But the other things in that shot, um, everybody knows, again, we forget things that we're taught as children, which is uh, if you go outside in the sun, the shadows all go in one direction. They all will run parallel. They never intersect ever, ever, ever. That's just the, one of the things of light. And right. yet all, in, in this shot here, you got the, the shadows are all going in four directions and they're going to intersect really soon. It's not like yeah. they're going to intersect off in the distance. And that only happens if the light source is very, very close. Or if you have multiple light sources, which they didn't bring stage lighting to the moon unless it was a stage. Um, other things in that shot would be tons of footprints all around in the ash. Remember the, the uniform four inches of ash everywhere for some apparent reason. And all these footprints, and yet there was not a single blast crater underneath that massive 10,000 pounds of thrust engine that was sitting yeah. there. No one wants to talk about that. The, uh, the satellite dish. And I had to come back and say, no, that satellite dish has a range of oh, 2,000 miles. It's like, and then they beamed from that to the spacecraft that was orbiting that, for, that to, the, um, to, the, uh, to the Earth. I'm going, okay, first off, it's 1969, right? That's a VHF transmitter. That thing's running off a car battery. Anyone yeah. that knows anything about radio broadcasting is like, it's all about power. It's all about wattage. And don't tell me it's like, oh, it's ultra low frequency or blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, no, no. I go, yeah. that thing was supposedly pumping out 10 frames of color video, a second and perfect two-way combination um, uh, communication to the earth. And how are you even lining up the shot? How, how are you pulling this off? And, and whatever. It's, it's, we get, they get away with it because of the things we are not taught. We're not taught engineering when we're going through high school. We're not. We're not taught about we, or um, physics and all that crap. So I mean, they get away with it. So no, the blue marble shots absolutely a waste of time. 
The, the, any, okay. Anything you see out there, it's completely computer generated. And while you're looking at the Blue Marble shots, find me a, a some de decent video of a satellite or even a still shot of a satellite. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, they have tons of images online of satellites, right? Images, not actual photographs. You know, oh, they're, so they're, they're conjured yeah. up. They're, no one's got yeah. any. It's it's be, And the thing is, you get a, the other thing is, suppose there's like, what, 10,000 objects flying around the globe right yeah. now? And yet NASA, NASA should be running to these things all the time. And if you're watching time-lapse things of NASA, you should see these glints of silver all the time. You don't. You don't. don't. We assume everything. Everything. We, we just assume it's all there. That We assume the proof is there. That's how everybody gets into this. You, you go in thinking, oh, well, there's tons of evidence for NASA. And the more you look, the realize it's just empty cardboard boxes. What about this, uh, Mark? Hmm. Uh, what about the, the spectacular astronomer extraordinaire Neil deGrasse Tyson. Did he ever say anything about the Earth being flat? Ha! <laughs> yes. Yes, he did. Well, what he did was, and again, the, the wonderful disinformation by Red Bull. So Red Bull comes out and does the Red Bull jump, you know, with, from, with Felix Bumgardner, where they take a guy up on a pressurized thing, and they take him to 130,000 feet, and he jumps off, and it's the world record of parachute jumps. Yeah. Well, Neil Tyson was interesting. I didn't think he would do this. He was at a convention, and he was, I don't know if he was just on a tear and he liked the audience. Sometimes you go too far. And so, he said that he thought it was scientifically dishonest because at 130,000 feet, you can never see the curvature. He goes, no, he goes, no civilian will ever see the curvature. And yet the Red Bull jump showed this severe curvature. And he said it was because he was using a fisheye lens, otherwise known as a peephole lens. Yeah. And he, he said, he goes, no, he, he goes, he goes, that is flat at 130,000 feet. And I made a special video about that because I've had people swear to me that they have seen the, so many people that have said they've seen the curvature from the air, from an airplane. It's like, okay, the airplane is fly capping out at about 40,000 feet. Well, the Red Bull jump was more than three times higher than that. So sure. how, and, and if the world's most popular scientist says that you can't see a curve, but you say it's a curve. Is Neil wrong? And I mean, yeah. you can watch in chat. There are people say, yeah, Neil's wrong. It's like, okay, here's where it comes down to. Because I've had people say they can see the curvature from a mountain, a balloon, the beach. I mean, literally, they can, they can, they can see it everywhere. It is straight up conditioning. It is straight up Orwellian conditioning, which is it's not that you see the curvature. You want to see the curvature. Your mind so wants it to be there because you've been told this over and over and over again that you have convinced yourself that it's actually happening. And the, again, I, I have to use a line from Star Trek Next Gen where, because it's, it's the five lights, four lights thing, which, oh, is, yeah. which is Picard was taken hostage by the Cardassians and at the end he was rescued. And what was happening was he was being tortured. And he was, and every time he, he was saying, um, he, they say, how many, and it's classic conditioning where they say, how many lights do you see up there? Four lights. And every time he said four lights, they, they hit him. And they said, no, it's five lights. And, you know, eventually you will break. And he, he, at the end, he says, he goes, he goes, the scariest thing for me was just before I was rescued, I saw five lights. And yeah. <laughs> what, what that means is, is like, look, if somebody repeats something to you over and over and over and over again, mm -hmm. you are going, even without pain, uh, you will start listening. And that's what was, that was, what was happening. And, uh, I mean, like, like even now, not to get off topic, I mean, you know, how many cases, how many cases, how many cases, so many cases mm -hmm. to where now there's people just swearing, you know, there's people locking themselves in their house. I just see this hor I've got horror stories of people that are just scared to death yes. that, that, that the world is dying around them. It's like, what are you talking about? I, I know no one that's died except for my uncle and but he was 88 years old he had had a stroke a couple of years ago and he got pneumonia yeah then he was diagnosed <laughs> it's like don't <laughs> don't don't tell me he died from yeah. the virus so it, some virus related cases yeah you know? yeah find me find me a the reason why I, again i'm off topic the reason why nobody you know americans you know are, are sneaking out and going to bars and doing these underground things is because you haven't scared them enough it's like f until you show me it's like until i know a guy is like it's like you know you see a guy named tom tom's a jogger <laughs> you know he's 35 years old he's perfect health until tom all of a sudden goes into a hospital a week later and then is dead and shocks the hell out of you. It's like, wow, I just saw Tom. No one's going to care. Americans are not going to care. They're just going to keep, they're just going to do the bare minimum. It's like, fine, I'll wear the mask. 
Well, well now yeah. it's going to get dicey. Anyway, sorry. Back to no, no. Back I, to whatever. I've talked a lot about this on this topic because it's a big thing in the room. I'm trying to get the truth out there about that. So I'm glad you said that because you know a lot of people are 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 believing what the press is doing, and that's reporting the numbers in a way that will elicit the most fear yeah. out of people. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it, the CNN is just notorious for it right now. I mean, and granted, that is what the media does. People don't understand the media does not like good news. They, they uh, make their most money off of fear. They always have. Uh, the producers that I have talked to over the last five years, and I have talked to a bunch, when they have a few drinks in them, they all say the same thing. It's like, publicly, we don't want anyone to die. Privately, we always want the plane to crash. And <laughs> it's true. I mean, they you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And so CNN, they, they have, you know, 2020 was their niche year. They made a crap load of money. Uh, because and all they had to do was say it's getting worse. It's getting worse. You should be afraid. A lot of cases getting worse. You know, do you know be be you know live in fear and it worked. There was you know at least for half the country, it absolutely people bought it hook line and sinker. It's like all right, great. You bet. That's exactly what's happening with uh, this whole thing about uh, you know flat Earth and, and uh, theories and everything. They're trying to ridicule it, block it, ban it, censor. Hey, Neil deGrasse Tyson, really quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also said something that I found interesting, and this is a YouTube that anybody out there can look up. If you look up Neil deGrasse Tyson and look up what he said, he essentially said that the Earth is an oblate spheroid that's larger on the bottom half than it is on the top half. And then he says it's it's actually pear-shaped. Yeah, that was a, probably a bad move on his part. He had to backtrack a lot on that because yeah. he said that to a university group where... He, Again, if you look look up oblate spheroid, it's basically kind of a, a semi squished basketball. And then he yeah. said it was lopsided on top of it that it was it was lower below than it was above. Yeah. And um, and he used pear shape. <laughs> That's and he said it's pear shaped. Yeah, yeah. And he said it was pear shaped, and it was just it was absolutely ridiculous. There was no um, there was no it, it did not help his case in the slightest. Because, remember, all the supposed shots, official and unofficial blue marble shots, are pixel-perfect spheres. Mm -hmm. They're pixel. They don't look. Look, when you see a shot of the globe, it never looks oblate. Ever, ever, ever. It never looks pear-shaped in the slightest. And, again, he had to backtrack and say, well, it's almost imperceivable. It's like, well, why'd you say it? Why'd you say yeah. it was pear-shaped? You don't say it's pear-shaped and then show us a perfect sphere. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And, again, I... I critique him, but at the same time, it's like there's nothing I can do. I mean, he's he's got a great stage presence. Unfortunately for them, there's only three media savvy uh, science guys in the world that mm -hmm. that they bring out. Um, one is Neil Tyson. The, the second is Brian Cox from from England, and the third is Michio Kaku from Japan. The, oh yeah, Michio Kaku. Yeah. Yeah, and after that, what do you got? Bill Nye? No. You know, Bill Nye, I did. A, I've done videos like, look, people don't understand. Bill Nye is not a scientist. He is an actor from Seattle. He was in a Seattle comedy troupe. Look, I'm from here. I know full well. He just yeah. got lucky. There, in fact, it wasn't even his idea. It was the uh, the producer of of um, Almost Live up here. He says, well, you know, you're tall. You got angular features. Put a lab coat on him. Had him do some science stuff, and then. Disney was looking for some family friendly stuff. And it's like, yeah, Bill Nye, the science guy, we could totally work with that. It got syndicated and the rest is history. You know, <laughs> he he's, he's invited on panels to talk about things. And he has asked about flat earth a lot. He's, he's asked about things that he has no business talking about. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical, right? Uh -huh. And he just abandoned that immediately for acting. And he had, he's on he's he's on panels talking about quantum physics and the Mars rover, and he, he goes to the White House. It's like, what are you doing? And it's because people recognize him as a media scientist. And it's like, no. And you look up his wiki thing. He's a science advocate. He even science. at least they they don't say, oh no, he's got his this and that. No, he's got a bachelor's in mechanical. Dolph Lundgren has more has more um, academic <laughs> experience than he does. Oh, that's funny. But, hey, here's an here's something I was thinking about yeah. really quickly. Yeah. Um, have you looked? You've looked into conspiracies. Have you looked into MH three hundred? That missing flight from Taiwan, I believe, or not Taiwan? Oh, yeah, the Indian Ocean flights. Yeah. 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 Well, the 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 flagships triple sevens that went down with all the modern black boxes, and no one wants to talk about what happened. Yeah. Exactly. One thing, two things I noticed. I have one speculation that's just a a, a thought, maybe an idea for a short story. 
But the thing that I saw on CNN that really opened my eyes to, to this, that sort of confirmed it, we apparently have satellites around the, the globe, the GPS system created by the military. Right. And then CNN actually said, well, there are gaps in the GPS system that planes fly into that, that go dark, and then they fly into you know uh, another area that the GPS satellite picks up. Yeah. And that's not what I was told. They should have the entire globe covered, but yet they actually reported this on CNN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are th supposedly, you got to remember, just about every modern system we have is built by the, by the uh, military. The internet, yeah. for example, that is a military system, so don't think that you can get away with anything encrypted. Uh, but the um, GPS system, that was the United States military from the mid-90s. It was basically an extension of the old Loran system, which was ground-based. They just slapped a new sticker on it, said that there was 32 overlapping blanket-covered satellites that were yeah. out there, jacked the price up, and then tied it to the planes. And the planes are just bouncing off their signals off of each other. But you, what you don't know is when the plane gets away from any island to where there's no islands within 150 miles, 200 miles... The, the GPS system goes into guess mode. It, it basically just goes into question mark mode, which is like, um, we kind of got an idea what your heading is and where you're supposed to be going, but until you get within um, radar range of another, another island, we're not going to be able to confirm that. And yeah. so, and it's really evident in the South Indian, South Atlantic, and um, uh, South Pacific. And, and even, but even in the North. I didn't realize this till after I made the clues. Like when when you fly to Hawaii from California, uh -huh. and when you leave the states, there's no islands between California and Hawaii. You're off the map. You you don't exist until you start getting close to Hawaii, and the people don't know that. And so yeah, losing losing planes in the Indian Ocean, yeah, it doesn't surprise me in the slightest. No, and I had a thought about that. It j just generated a neat idea because I'm, I'm an author and I like to c come up with stories and everything. And I just thought, what if the pilots suspected or they were convinced that the Earth was flat and they wanted to make it to the dome and see if they could fly through the dome? Right. And they hit for Antarctica, you know, went off the grid. And that's why they couldn't, the press couldn't report what really happened or where the plane might really be. And they, you know, tried to, to get through the dome. It's just a, a Possibly, thought. or they went off course, or they were shot down by someone, or who... I mean, it could have been a terrorist thing, and you wouldn't have known. I mean, it could have been a weak... I think it was more of... It was... Uh, the planes were exploited because somebody mm -hmm. figured out that um, they, they were never going to be found when they yeah. got out there. I mean, you get a member of the black boxes. We're talking flagship, 777, state-of-the-art. And yeah. those that plane was never, ever found? Come on. Yeah, yeah, come on, not not, and they would happen twice. There were two planes down there that that it happened to. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Um, well, hey, here's another one. Yeah. I've heard. Um, not sure if you were talking about it. Probably you. Uh, it was with some guests who were military mm -hmm. in the Navy saying that they were painting targets with lasers that shoot straight lines farther than they should have been able to do it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 50, 50 nautical miles and and probably longer, but they can only give me the declassified things where. There are um, Navy ships, the Sparrow missile system, you can paint targets, you know, it's it's point to point, you're not bouncing off of anything, and they have to paint the targets before, so the missile system can lock on, it's it's standard missile tech, and they didn't even realize it, you know, again, the forest for the trees, you couldn't, they couldn't see, and a lot of military guys came to me, there is no firing solution in any military, I don't care if you're shooting howitzers or tanks, or um, even submarines with torpedoes, Nothing, nothing takes into account the curvature or the spin of the Earth, the Coriolis effect. And yet CNN will drag out a sniper every six months and say, oh, yeah, I made this really great long distance shot, you know, less than a mile. And I had to take in the curvature of the Earth. It's like, really? Because I shoot and I have yeah. never seen a scope in my life that it has windage and elevation. That's all it has. No, I've never seen a scope with Coriolis effect on it. And yeah. these, none of these guys that shoot these really, really long distances, you know, 20, 30, 50, and way further, take into account either of those things and the firing solutions. So, I'm sorry, any sniper that says, says the, um, they're doing that, it says it's a placebo effect at best. And at worst, they're just lying straight to the camera just, just to push the narrative. Oh, wow. Okay, well, here's another one. Hmm. What about... Okay, what about... You got the... Painting the lasers, you got um, another proof that oh, I just slipped my mind. Oh, yeah, Suez Canal, long bridges and railroad tracks. Do not yeah, build. No, yeah, it's never it's never built into engineering. Oh, yeah. heck, if you're going to go that far, go back to the um, the Roman aqueducts. 
the Romans did had no idea about the, the curvature of the Earth and the mathematical form of how the ro- how the the aqueducts work, and that's because it's straight. It it, it works every time. It, it doesn't need it. There is no curvature, and not we're gonna have to wrap this up pretty soon. But sure. But think about this, um, because not only let, let's delve into this just a little bit. If it is flat and enclosed, it could be a simulation. A lot of people say, you know, we've had movies like The Matrix and The 13th Floor and stuff like that. You got to remember that every game that you play, trying to relate to the general audience here, I don't care if it's GTA or Fortnite or Minecraft or World of Warcraft or whatever, it is built on a perfectly flat world. Yes, of course, there's hills and valleys and stuff like that, but the edges line up to each other. And that is because programming is always more efficient if you're working with a flat box and if the character isn't going to notice the difference then you don't have to build it in the character doesn't you know it's like well it's not a curved world it's like no it's absolutely in fact it's not even um it's not even a a a dinner plate world it's a cake box everything's squared off because computers computers don't know technically how to make circles which is why pixels are absolutely square so oh wow that's interesting yeah all right well mark hey i appreciate you talking yeah Uh, time with us is there a last thought that you'd like to leave with everyone who's watching listening to this yeah yeah absolutely and that is look take what i say with a grain of salt i'm not here to convince you i'm not here to persuade you all i'm here is to put a thought into your head plant a seed as it were you get figure it out you know everybody that gets into flat earth hates it everybody that goes into flat earth tries to disprove it and so a quick warning to the listeners out there. If you like your life the way it is, you think you got a good bead on things, <laughs> don't look into this. Because and this, I'm not trying to do reverse psychology. I'm absolutely serious. Because if you do, there's a, a point kind of like the Matrix where you, uh, you can't come back from it. If you break down the globe yourself, if you're the one that looks into it and all of a sudden realizes like, oh man, the globe's an absolute lie, you're never going to be able to put it back together because you were the one that tore it down. I didn't do it. You did it. There you go. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you very much to this most distinguished uh, guest, Mark Sargent, for talking about Flat Earth with us and the space program and all the areas we covered. So thank you again, Mark, for uh, sharing your time with yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Happy to do it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody.